Hello, hello, my friends. Please let me know if you would, the wonderful several of you that are here uh, early. Will you let me know how the audio is? Because I, for some reason, it was like registering ridiculously high when I was just talking normally just before I started. So I wanted to go live a couple minutes early so you guys can help me fine tune it possibly before we hop into this brand new format, which welcome to all of you. Uh, I'll say this again at strictly at five. Welcome to the first episode of Above the Line. This has sort of been the brainchild. I can't even claim credit for this. This is sort of my fiance and I's little like mind melding, a great way to put all these stories, these new stories, get to talk about them and kind of a format because I used to do a series called This Week On, which I talked about what I was watching that week. That was a little bit like what's the word to get myself to edit and film it it was almost like beyond the point whereas I feel like a live stream is a great way to kind of capture this and I figured this would be a fun episode episodic series to do on the channel where each episode kind of covers the week prior or any breaking news stories and uh, we can kind of I I've got a couple ideas up my sleeve let's just say for this series but this is going to be the inaugural episode and thank you to all of you who are already here um since it is five now and we've confirmed that the audio is good to go welcome everyone to the very first episode of above the line um this series as i was saying before kind of came out of the idea of there are so many entertainment news stories that i think it's so crucial to anyone who's interested in the space or who works sorry just hit the mic works in the space to read these stories and kind of get a quick digest of them but it's sort of hard because movies are separated from tv or separated from more of the business end of stories so i wanted to bring that all together and i'm thinking i'm gonna let the show notes if you will for this series live on an assembled press article and i've forgotten now i just realized to put kind of my links in the description down below but i will be doing that immediately after the stream ends so that you can kind of reference all the different stories. Um, basically, everything is meant to be a bite-sized little five-minute at the maximum segment of a certain story. You guys will react to it once I finish telling kind of my piece and like the TLDR, if you will, too long didn't read, that's what I keep calling it, um, version of the story, then we can kind of talk about it for a couple minutes and then move on. So we're gonna try to, you know, by six, we're gonna try to have this wrapped up and done. Um, and then I'm going to try to maybe elaborate on anything on Assembled Press because I haven't used that the way I had initially hoped to. So welcome to Above the Line. Let's get started with the first story. Thank you to everyone who is here. Um, feel free to comment as I'm talking and I'll get to your comments once I've done with the story at hand. So the first story of Above the Line in Above the Line history is something that is actually concerning Above the Line. So the name comes from the concept of there are people in the entertainment industry who work above the above the line which are people who get paid at a different point in the movie making process than people who work below the line below the line you can think of as on set above the line is kind of the suits or the actors or the directors and the writers the people who kind of without them the product the idea doesn't come out but the people below the line are the ones physically there on set filming it the gaffers the boom operator the best boy all of these people that's those so Above the line kind of gives us our little like above the movie scene idea. You get where I'm going with this? Okay. Our first story is very above the line and it's a rumored story. So it's a little bit speculative of whether Disney might be buying Comcast shares of Hulu and or trading ESPN to do so. So this is a story that's kind of been developing over the fourth quarter of 2022 and now in the sports world. So Disney, as some of you may or may not know, owns ESPN. And ESPN, being a sports network, requires a huge amount of money and resources to keep it going because exclusive sports deals, as you can see by football going to Amazon, baseball going to Apple TV+, Plus, now live soccer, in some cases for the US, going to HBO Max, you need a lot of money to get those exclusive deals. And ESPN has shilled out a ton of money to get Monday Night Football exclusive on ESPN. But Disney, many people don't think of that as like a sports provider in the way you would Fox Sports or anything else, like any sort of just live TV channel. And so Disney has had to put a huge amount of their resources economically and financially into ESPN to kind of sustain it. However, the rest of their business is 
largely in part of the way that Bob Iger has shaped it over the last length of his initial run as CEO, now his kind of boomerang look back attempt. Um, all of that has been based on IP of accumulating Star Wars and growing that of Pixar being a recognizable name, of Marvel growing, that franchising of films under a certain brand name that is all under the umbrella of Disney, that's Disney's bread and butter. That's why we all know and associate with Disney. So if you could free up some money potentially with ESPN by offshooting that or spinning it off to be its own independent company, as a lot of the analysts, like the economic analysts are predicting Disney will do, that would free up a lot more money for things like improving your Disney Plus slate or improving CGI costs, things like that. You could free up a good portion of your budget to do something like that. However, there's a little bit of a rumor, and this is, again, this is speculation. There's just a couple of sports accounts that have been talking about this. But Comcast, if you don't know, which is tied up with NBC Universal, owns still a 30% share of Hulu, which is under Disney. So when Disney purchased Fox in 2019, although I think the deal took like a year or two to go through, when Disney purchased Fox or 20th Century Fox, excuse me, they obtained their initial 30% of Hulu, but gained another 30%. So they're a majority shareholder in Hulu. That's why you can get the Disney bundle with Hulu. However, they had kind of marked a deal back in 2019. Again, you can kind of see their long-term plans now with and uh, with Comcast or excuse me, with Comcast or NBC Universal to eventually obtain that last 30% to solely own Hulu. And the earliest that that was allowed to happen was 2024. That's sort of the deal that Disney and Comcast had set in place. However, Bob Chapek, shortly before he was removed as CEO, really wanted this to happen sooner. And when Bob Iger was brought back as as CEO, many people were predicting that he was going to make some super big moves with the company. So this is sort of an amalgamation of like multiple stories. So I apologize if that was sort of a jumbled mess of companies and ownership and tying that all together. But the concept could potentially be, and I only bring this up because it will be a developing story probably as we get further into 2023, of what Disney is going to choose to do for ESPN and if they might potentially use ESPN or the value associated with that brand to become the sole owners of Hulu and kind of continue the empire of Disney plus Hulu and ESPN plus, but without the ESPN plus element, if that makes sense. So that's like a very, very top level look at all of these different deals that are sort of happening in the background at, I mean, at any given moment. And I just thought it was really interesting because, of course, with Bob Chapek being ousted as CEO pretty in a big kind of shocking way and then bringing Bob Iger back after he kind of made a big deal about his like retirement campaign in a way like he did a memoir he did a bunch of interviews like he like that was a known thing that was going to happen for a long time and very quickly Bob Chapek was taken out and a lot of people thought that was reason to do with the park reasons to do with how well Disney movies were doing and kind of anything in regards to Disney a lot of that's just been up in the air so it's really interesting to see some of these more businessy money deals in the background happen that could be a reason why Bob Iger was brought back because maybe he had a strategy set in place that they didn't believe that JPEG could follow through again this is a highly speculative story and so very something that's just sort of like look into at your own time and interest but um but yeah so let's see what you guys have to say again some of these stories you may not have as much to say some of them you might but Alex says I can see during this year Iger will make a big move for ESPN so Both ESPN and ABC are kind of speculated to be something that Disney dumps or properties and companies that Disney dumps this year because they just require so much money to run that I don't think they're bringing as much money in for Disney as you're necessarily putting out. Like it was great initially for Disney to kind of spill its web into every area of entertainment. And I think in some ways ESPN has been a great way for them to do that. However, when you look at the ultimate goals of your company and if you're trying to focus on putting money in places that ultimately bring in more revenue for you, such as these big blockbuster films like the Marvel movies or the Star Wars movies, would you rather have that money available for you to do something like build another version of the volume where you can film more stuff? I'm not, I don't know exactly what all these companies and things cost, so I'm not, I don't want to sound naive and just say like, oh, you can just translate 
trading ESPN away for these Hulu shares. But it's just kind of an interesting model, especially when you consider that Comcast or NBC Universal. So Comcast Xfinity owns NBC Universal. This is another thing we could go into at some point in Above the Line because that's one of my favorite things of the industry is to see kind of how scarily there's only a few companies that really control everything. But it's just it's it's interesting to see so many people predict that this is something that's going to happen. Um, if you look up Disney ESPN, like a lot of the stories have to do with whether they're going to dump this. And from word on the streets, I'm not going to give my personal opinion on this or say I, I'm not really an expert in the sports space, let's say. But I know that the Pro Bowl Olympics has been maybe not everyone's favorite thing this year to come out of, which that's starting today um, with next week being Super Bowl Sunday and things like that. So again, just super interesting. And I agree, like I, Bob Iger seems to have a much more story-minded business approach. Like I'm not trying to say like he's only focused on making these movies good and that sort of thing. Obviously a company needs to make money, but I think he's realized that instead of doing some of these other cash grabby type things that I think people have associated with Chapex kind of roll over the CEO portion of Disney to see Iger come in I definitely think this is something that I I just I could see it being cut so Alex seems to agree and then we'll get to our next story I just spilled that on myself great great love that okay okay so our next story our next story is a little bit of a personal interest story for me also How do we feel about developing this to where I could weekend update this and put something here? That's what I want to get to. Oh, Paul, before we move on, Paul says, "Um, I've logged the theme parks both sides at Disney and Universal. It's definitely noticeable where money goes towards. Exactly. Like, I think I went to Disney in December and the Genie Plus system, I I don't frequent Disney enough to know how this impacts the annual visitor or somebody with an annual pass or really just anybody who was used to the fast pass system before I knew that the fast pass was kind of done away with but the genie plus system it's a much you're bringing in more money all the time like and I'm sure that that money was still being captured for fast passes prior um just within your ticket or within your cost of your hotel room to stay on Disney to get those fast passes but the way the genie plus system was set up it was just it was really interesting to see how paying for that gets you gets you these fast passes and these right like it's just interesting to see the way the business model of the parks has changed and I also think it's an interesting time for the parks because there's a lot of rides that have been classic Disney rides for forever that are sort of being revamped and Disney has a history of doing that um the Seven Dwarfs Mine Train is a great example of taking a Snow White ride and turning it into this new thing that kind of better fits today's generation but of course there's the Disney park purists who don't necessarily want those things to change and feel like this is again just a cash grab move it's not actually about like the sanctity of the parks um but it's about making something that people are going to pay more money to fast pass so it's it's definitely very interesting I've had a lot of friends through college who had worked in the Disney college program or people who frequented the parks a lot more frequently than I did and it was interesting to go back this time and see how much versus the last time I've been to Disney which was you know it was a while ago several years see what's changed and where the money has gone um John says the issue with letting go of ESPN is that live sports is one of the only few things that gets ratings ad revenue agreed but in some ways if you kept Hulu because Hulu has the live tv option that I assume in many ways if not always Disney is making money from if you can if that money of live TV, you can still get it, but you don't have to shill out the money for exclusivity rights for certain broadcasts or the talent fees, I'm sure, are associated with keeping people like Peyton Manning and Eli Manning on. I think it's just like, like I was reading something about how, again, this could be slightly outdated, but how Tony Romo, his deal was like over $100 million. It's just really interesting to see that this sports, for the ad revenue it brings in, which I totally agree with you, John, you have to put so much more in and maybe the ratio of investment to profit or revenue um not revenue profit is higher in a different area for disney um or if there's ways that i don't know it's just it's just interesting to see 
what might happen. This is, again, very speculative, very combining some stories, not really assuming that this is for sure going to happen. It's just interesting because if you look at the way things have gone at Disney, they have clearly been, and intelligently so, moving towards creating a larger and larger streaming presence than necessarily what they do on live TV. For example, Dancing with the Stars this past season, exclusively on Disney+. Plus. Same with a couple of Disney, like, Christmassy specials they had. They had that Encanto live from the Hollywood Bowl. They've proven that Disney+, Plus, they have enough people on there who people who want to see those ABC specials or those ABC family type live things from the parks now have a different outlet for that and may rather, they may get higher viewership numbers on something like Dancing with the Stars when it's already on a platform that people are already paying for and going to on a weekly basis because that's how they release their shows. I agree that sports is a different animal, so that's where it's interesting. But um, the only issue with keeping ESPN is that it costs them a lot of money paying to air sports leagues and events, but it still gets some ratings. Agreed, but it seems like people want to move, in the business sphere, want to move away from live television unless it's through a streaming provider the way that you watch live TV through, <coughs> excuse me, through Hulu or YouTube or whatever else. And then Paul says, definitely agree about Genie Plus. It works better for people at resorts. They get first dibs on a lot and uh, totally get about revamping rides. Right. And like for me, a person, a younger person who doesn't have any kids going to Disney, I had no problem running back and forth between the parks to make my Genie Plus fast passes like the best that they could be. If I had to be in Tomorrowland from the Haunted Mansion and I had to zoom over there within 15 minutes, I could do that. But people who are families with kids, who people who have different interests like within their party going to Disney rather than just like me and my fiance wanting to go on the same rides, that's a totally different beast in a way that really does, you know, if you're charging a la carte for two people versus a family of five, that's a lot different story. So, all right. Thank you all for a little weighing in on my little Disney adventure. The next one, though, we're going to go back kind of to NBC Universal and talk about Peacock. So Peacock, if you don't know, is the NBC Universal's brand's streaming service. All of your Bravo, all of your regular NBC, MSNBC. I think it used to be NBC Sports, but I think that's kind of been gone away with in recent years, if I remember correctly. But Peacock is planning or has actively removed the ability for new subscribers to get in on their free tier. So when Peacock first came out, again, around that 2019-2020 area, they had a different model to where you could, at the lowest level, for free, watch some of their content that was ungated or accessible to the free tier. Now, for example, for The Office, this went up to, I think, season four. You could watch the first four seasons for free, kind of binge them all. But as it got to the later seasons, you had to pay. So the concept was kind of an easy in. So to get people associated with Peacock and having Peacock accounts, you would join for free. I think one of the biggest offerings they had initially too was getting to watch late night early. So things like uh, Jimmy Fallon is on NBC and uh, Seth Meyers. You could watch those shows earlier um, because they obviously aren't filming them that late in the evening. Um, you could watch them earlier on Peacock. So it was a great business model to get people into watching Peacock and having Peacock accounts, like I said, and then say you get addicted to a show like initially Yellowstone. Well, I need to watch the next season of Yellowstone, so I'm going to pay to be able to watch the next season of Yellowstone. So I think it was a great model. But what's interesting is a couple of Peacock shows recently have done well. One of my favorite, which is kind of selfishly why I chose this story, it may not be as relevant to all of you, but it's going to kind of be my plea for people to go watch it, especially now that it's been renewed for a second season. It's called The Traders, and it is a reality game show, kind of like a game of Among Us or Mafia, Secret Hitler, Werewolf, that kind of game where there are faithful people who are there to do tasks, compete for money, and then there are the traitors who are sort of working against the rest of the team, the faithfuls, to murder them in the middle of the night or to maybe sabotage some of their missions and that sort of thing. And if a traitor is left standing at the end of the show, they get all the money. The first season, I was addicted to. I swear I watched it, to, I watched it probably in like 24, 36 hours. Like I just binged it. And it is also because it has the amazingly compelling host of Alan Cumming to live in this Scottish castle and give this very knives out type feel 
Simultaneously as the Traitors is coming out, Poker Face, which is from the brilliant mind of Ryan Johnson, who is the creative behind Knives Out and Glass Onion, it created this really cool little niche for Peacock of around the same time, all this mystery content or murder mystery type content, cozy mysteries to come out, kind of capitalize on the success maybe of Only Murders in the Building and that sort of thing. And so what I think is interesting is now is the perfect time from a business perspective for Peacock to get rid of that lesser tier because a lot of their new brand defining content like Poker Face and The Traders or things like that, that they really want to make a staple of their platform, they're already behind paywalls. You can't watch those things for free anyways. And so it makes sense to get rid of that ad free or that free tier, especially too when you consider the fact that services like Hulu and HBO Max are now offering ad supported versions of their platform at a lower cost, but certainly not for free. And so when you introduce something like Peacock having a absolutely free tier that is ad supported, people are kind of have proven in the space that for content that they enjoy, they're willing to pay money and still get ads or pay premium to not get those ads. That's the society that we live in. That's the new business model for streaming. Um, and it is a great way to increase your revenue stream because if you have ads and you have subscription payments monthly, that's also like, that's important. So anyways, this was sort of just my plea for you to watch The Traders because I think it's fantastic and it was renewed for a second season. Um, it is also like one of the biggest releases for... I know the initial version of The Traders premiered in England uh, and it was a BBC show, I believe. And so this was like a BBC three, I think, show to air in America and was kind of like the biggest that they've had since re-releasing. It also stars some of your favorite reality stars. It's like the perfect dumping ground. Maybe I could have found a better word to say that, but a better term for that. But it's the perfect like graveyard for... Uh, older reality stars or reality stars who like maybe aren't their shows aren't in season or whatever so for example this first season which again I highly recommend you watch uh, featured Ari a former bachelor uh, it featured a couple of survivor winners and or contestants who have re like repeatedly appeared it had a lot of Bravo stars including a guy from this new series that they're coming out with on Bravo called Summer House Kate from Below Deck, who was kind of like the first person I recognized. There's a real housewife on there. Um, anyways, I'm just saying like it's the perfect mix of a reality show and a great place for all of these people who are now kind of the Instagram models and the people who like have fame because of reality TV, but maybe aren't breaking into like the acting sphere or the singing sphere or the music sphere or like anything else. Like the this is kind of a perfect place for those personality people to go. Like highly highly recommend it although now I feel bad saying that because I know that all of Peacock stuff is behind a paywall but um it's a really really great binge and if you're looking for something that's a little bit more uplifting than some of the content that we're going to talk about at the end of this episode like The Last of Us and The Knock at the Cabin I highly recommend um let's see so we've got John saying I feel like Peacock might go away in like one to two years if they don't get enough subscribers they're really lagging behind the competitors they definitely are and this is an interesting time again for them to introduce this like no free system because if you can bring in subs but they're not paying you're not going to be as sustainable i'm interested to see how some of this more original content goes for them um or if maybe eventually they'll get to the place where they're getting rid of things like bravo to solely have these shows on peacock i think the problem that peacock has is it's not it's not as distinctly named as something like an HBO Max or, excuse me, a Disney Plus, where those are associated with brands that people already know and trust for, excuse me, specific types of content. Whereas Peacock, like, most of the content on Peacock 2, other than their originals, so when This Is Us was coming out um, or anything like that, like an NBC network show, those were accessible on Hulu anyways. And most people are probably going to watch, like, you're not going to have multiple streaming services if you don't need to, basically. And so I could see Peacock kind of being axed by many households if it's now pay to play kind of deal. Like, you have to pay to watch that stuff. Um, but I do think it's a little underrated, and Alex agrees, that I think there's some really great things that Peacock has, like The Office, like Yellowstone, um, things that have become 
kind of it's the only place to get certain things which is extremely key and crucial like while there are some of those shows like This Is Us or things that were currently coming out at the time that were available on other streaming services, uh, there's certain stuff now on Peacock that is really getting a lot of word of mouth appeal that is exclusively available on Peacock. So I definitely agree with you, John, in saying that they're definitely in a tumultuous time and like, will they last? But I also feel that they're not like the newest comers. Like MGM Plus just got released recently and like I I'm not gonna get MGM Plus. Like, I'm also very confused because I thought that Amazon had kind of bought that library. And so I'm, conf I'm, again, I'm very confused with what it is. Whereas Peacock has at least had the name recognition for a couple of years to exist. I agree. It's definitely not as popular as a lot of other th of its competitors. Um, but it'll be interesting to see what kind of content they continue to come out with to kind of brand themselves because um, I think the other key to having a streaming service is you need not only a good library, but you need new original content that people are kind of continually coming back for. Um, I don't know what will happen to the current free accounts. All of the articles that I had read were sort of insinuating that this is a new thing. So I don't think they can force people, at least not yet. I wonder if on the free accounts, I'll do some digging on this and I might do like a follow up or in the show notes might add like a little check back in the description wonderful world of movies check back because i think I, I mean i that was the part of the article that wasn't as clear what they're doing about people who currently have the free accounts but we will see and john yes poker face is getting i mean coming off of the heels of glass onion releasing at christmas and poker face being ryan johnson being branded with that same yellow font um having natasha leone who is such a star in her own right. Like all of those elements I think could make Poker Face and some of these shows that are currently coming out on Peacock kind of a make it or break it for the service. So that'll be interesting to follow and see um, see how that goes. But um, uh, John says that the he believes that the free account Peacocks are fathered in. Um, I feel like that might be something that maybe in a year's time they have to like – give you a warning that you're going to get paid. But um, I don't know. Yeah, that's interesting. Uh, I wonder if they're putting more things kind of behind that paywall to incentivize people who are still on the free plan to bump up their subscription. I'm really surprised they aren't leveraging their IP from movies into TV shows like Disney does with Marvel and Star Wars and HBO is doing more with DC. Agreed. Um, I think it's because there's certain things, like I'm trying to think of what NBC Universal owns. Like I believe they own the fast franchise uh which that was actually a project i worked on in, in college was like what would nbc universal's marvel universe look like um i yellowstone i think there's certain stuff that's on paramount plus and there's certain stuff that was on peacock um yellowstone's like a really interesting animal when it comes to these streaming services because i think it's available very exclusively on one or two of them um but i think there was something a while ago where Pe like a couple months ago peacock had the rights um to streaming like the first couple of seasons exclusively and then the new stuff was coming out on paramount plus but if you wanted to like start from the beginning you had to do peacock so again stuff like that that they're kind of taking a risk on banking that that's successful and yellowstone blew up the way it did just very interesting um Yes, exactly. This is what I was talking about. They, I believe Peacock has the rights to the earlier seasons of Yellowstone. And to watch the new stuff, you have to have Paramount+. Plus. I believe if that's, but I think that's the deal that they struck with Taylor Sheridan. And then I believe the new spinoff shows for Yellowstone are available exclusively on Paramount+. Plus, But the actual Yellowstone is, like the OG Yellowstone is on Peacock. So again, super interesting. But there's things like that that could sustain Peacock to the point that they make some hit show and people start subscribing. Peacock also owns DreamWorks films like Shrek and Illumination with the Speckle Me. They do. However, if I understand it correctly, DreamWorks, uh, DreamWorks, I think has streaming deals for original shows with Netflix. Like there's the How to Train Your Dragon show on Netflix. I believe there's... A couple other like DreamWorks spin-off things that are Netflix shows. So again, it, 
this is where like the world of IP ownership and like brand ownership is really dicey because other than really with Disney, you can't make a blanket statement over who owns what because like take something like How to Train Your Dragon. That's a DreamWorks movie that you can stream on Peacock because they have the streaming rights but they may not have the distribution rights for future TV shows, which may be a Netflix thing. And that may be simply, again, usually when something like that doesn't make sense, just assume that whatever platform something is on is paying the most money for it. And therefore the original owner of the content is making the most money off of that. So DreamWorks in this case scenario might be making the most amount of money by having, um, by having Netflix stream those original series and things like that. So again, it's not, I'm not an expert on all of this stuff. I understand why certain things, but that's sort of your like default go-to if things don't make sense. Um, but yeah, there's, yeah, there's the Monster Universe, there's Jurassic Park, um, but it all really depends on the individual deal for the individual movie, um, streaming rights, if something is exclusively on what pla one platform versus for a while Parks and Rec was available on Hulu, Netflix, and I believe another streaming service, Abbott Elementary right now. You can stream all of it on Hulu, but you can also stream the first season on HBO Max. Things like that, they're just, the distributor is just trying to make the most money, or in the case of something like Abbott, to get it seen by the most eyes so that people are either tuning in weekly to boost those ABC ratings on Wednesday nights, or so that it can get kind of awareness for awards. So that first season being available on HBO Max to me signals that like, the reason that show is getting the awards it's getting is because it's kind of widespread and people can watch it in multiple places. So it's it's all these things that a company might have it as a priority. But um, but yeah. So okay, we ready to move on to the next story? This one was a lively discussion. I appreciate all of you for that. Um, this one's kind of a short little tidbit, but I thought it was really interesting because I do think it's something that I've noticed that I don't believe you can buy Netflix gift cards anywhere, or at least now you can't. But going forward, Netflix has partnered with one of the U.S.'s largest retail chains, Walmart, to merchandise exclusive or exclusively release merchandise and gift cards at a $20.1999 value at Walmart. So going forward, you will see things like Outer Banks and Stranger Things merchandise sold exclusively at Walmart, um, like Netflix branded toys and and clothes and snacks like this article that I will eventually link I apologize that I haven't linked yet this article is going into a lot of detail about how Netflix is trying to get new revenue streams because while Netflix may be the largest streaming service still and may have the largest audience of course there's the widespread password sharing issue that Netflix faces where people are not willing to uh, buy individual Netflix accounts, especially as their prices skyrocket. They've yet to release their ad supported tier, um, which has kind of been knocked around in the like cultural lexicon for a while as to whether they'll do that. But um, yes, they're going to be doing the Walmart partnership going forward. Um, and this is kind of their hope, I think, to just, again, bring in some more money, uh, create things like streaming snacks, and really recognize the fact that People who watch Netflix are, they have a brand loyalty, but a lot of times it's, it's for a specific show. It's not just, I'm only going to have Netflix because that's just not the world we live in. Most people own or subscribe to multiple different streaming services at once and they don't just pay for one anymore. It's just not realistic. So for them to kind of recapture people's attention, I think this is kind of a smart and interesting move because Disney obviously kind of doesn't really have to deal with this because they're Disney. They're a lot larger. Um, I don't know that Hulu branded things would do as well, but I'd be interested if Hulu, based on the demographics of people who own Hulu, maybe they'd go towards Target or something. Like this is just an interesting to see one streaming service, not just come out with a merch line that's accessible everywhere, but specifically to partner with one retailer. Um, so again, interesting stuff if you're gonna need to get somebody a netflix gift card going forward you're gonna have to go to walmart for that basically and alex says netflix also has an online shop called netflix shop but really excited for the walmart shop walmart partnership they do 
I feel like I've looked on it before though, and I believe some of their stuff is kind of like wildly priced. From my understanding, some of this that they were talking about, it seemed like Stranger Things action figures. I wonder if this will apply to things like Funko. I don't know because Funko is kind of an independent company of like Netflix. Like they make Netflix. I don't know. Again, this is an interesting thing with the deal. Like who, what does this affect going forward? Um, I mean, I know there's Walmart exclusive Funkos. Will all Stranger Things Funkos going forward or all Netflix related Funkos going forward be Walmart exclusives? I don't know. An interesting thing to just keep your eye out for since that one's kind of like a firm story rather than like a what's going to happen here thing. Okay. And now to maybe my most favorite <laughs> segment of this. It's going to be our box office winners and kind of our replay. I'm trying to think of a better segment for this. Um, these will be time stamped later when I go back in. Um, I'm going to need water before this one. So who won the box office and like what are our kind of important takeaways from the week? So the most important takeaway is that Knock at the Cabin, the M. Night Shyamalan title, starring Dave Bautista, our cover star of our thumbnail for this episode. Knock at the Cabin opened number one this weekend, and it opened against Avatar. Now, of course, Avatar has been in theaters for several, several weeks now, but uh, it's the first title, the first film to open at number one while against Avatar. So nothing else that has come out since Avatar has been released has kind of topped it, but this weekend, Knock at the Cabin with 14 million did so. However, I think this is the most interesting story that I'll talk about today. 80 for Brady, which is the kind of like, to put it in a, in a very simple way, an old lady movie about thinking that Tom Brady is awesome and going to watch that, um, starring some of the most iconic uh, older actresses working today. Um, Rena Moreno, Sally Fields, etc. It actually only was under Knock at the Cabin by about 2 million, so it came in at about 12 million for the weekend. And it brought in more audience members, more, more butts in seats, if you will, than did Knock at the Cabin because, but the reason that it's not as much box office dollars wise, is that 80 for Brady had a reduced ticket cost. So often when a new blockbuster film comes out for a weekend, so take for example, when Ant-Man comes out in two weeks or a week, that will have like an, movie theaters for that weekend will up ticket prices for that specific movie. So you'll actually be paying more to go see Ant-Man Quantumania than you would any other movie that comes out that weekend. But 80 for Brady did the inverse of that, where the ticket was cheaper for 80 for Brady, for 80 for Brady, the ticket for 80 for Brady was cheaper than any other ticket that weekend. I want to say it was coming in on average at around 970, whereas most tickets were about 1240 or something like that. So what's super interesting is that this was a model to bring in people, an audience that is not usually represented in films, like big films that are coming out, that a lot of films like kind of an older audience, basically, an older demographic of people were brought into this movie and incentivized to come see this movie by lower ticket costs. And they got more people in seats than they did Knock at the Cabin. So again, all of this is a little bit of a speculative versus like number of tickets sold versus the actual money. Very just interesting model. And I think, I think that it's just cool to see that certain movies might you can kind of do just as well with certain movies by kind of changing your business model on it. I think it was just, I don't know, it's super interesting. And then when you consider that the majority of film going dollars comes from people who go to the theater more often rather than people who go, what is the t statistic now? I'm trying to remember. It's something like you get more money by people or you can, this is what it is. You can take people who go to the theater a couple times a year and get them to go a few more times a lot easier than you can get people who never go to the theater to go like once or twice. So to incentivize people to go see more movies, like for example, if I needed to go see a movie that weekend, maybe I would have chosen, I, I didn't. <laughs> I saw Nog of the Cabin at a different, at a press screening, but not paying for it. But 
if I had wanted to go see a movie really desperately this weekend and I was looking at ticket costs, I might go see 80 for Brady simply because I want to go watch a movie that's fun, that's light, which Knock the Cabin was not. They were definitely not competing for the same audience, but it's also cheaper. Again, this is just interesting and it was something that was tried out with this film and it'll be interesting to see. And this isn't just for the opening weekend too. This is continuing throughout the rest of 80 for Brady's run. So again, a cool way to say like instead of making this movie on streaming and just try to like make some money back for the film to release it in theaters and incentivize people to go see it with cheaper tickets that's pretty cool um but then knock at the cabin so our winner our box office our box office beast for the weekend our winner for the weekend dave bautista incredible in this film okay i i think i'm still gonna do like a short little review of this beyond uh, above the line and what i'm talking about right now but dave bautista fantastic in this movie he maybe from the outside of the roles he plays you kind of just see him as the muscle like the intimidating force but he really has such depth in this particular performance that it is incredible and Chris from Filmstock my good buddy he did a really great short that I highly recommend you watch and I will put in the description again once I finish because I forgot to do it beforehand um he did a really great video talking about the WWE wrestlers the rock uh John Cena and Dave Bautista and how their transition to acting has sort of gone and where he'd sort of rank them. And I think he did a really great job talking about Dave Bautista's strategy for his career and the roles that he clearly chooses to pick with his team to kind of differentiate himself from that sort of initial image of like big, strong, intimidating guy, um, that WWE wrestler persona. Um, the movie Knock at the Cabin was pretty thought-provoking um it struggles with the idea of who are you going to protect in an apocalypse if you have the opportunity to save the world or save your family like what are you going to do again I think that's like a really cool interesting thing and it, the movie really oscillates between you believing that there is an issue and believing that there's not one um and kind of seeing like how the different characters in this story play it out um it happens solely at the cabin which is a really cool, like, storytelling element. But I have I have not been that tense watching something, watching a movie, let me say, because The Last of Us has had me on my toes every week, stressed, tense, struggling for breath, like, all, all the time. And so this movie, as good as I think it was, like, I think it's probably a pretty standard M. Night Shyamalan movie. I haven't seen all of his movies. I don't think this was, like, the best one ever but again I haven't seen all of them um uh I do I I, I think I just need <laughs> to be honest between this The Last of Us and then me recently starting Chernobyl and then watching Everything Everywhere all at once finally watching that yes I did I need a little bit less like end of the world situation I need a little bit less doom and gloom um Again, this could be this media kind of being the way that we view thing of being very life and death. And that's always been something in a lot of dystopian media or in M. Night Shyamalan's media uh, projects. But for now, you know, after the last couple of years we've had, after, after watching all this media, I need stuff that's a little bit more lighthearted. You know what I'm saying? So, Knock at the Cabin, I think it was decent. I think it was good. Let's see what you guys have to say. So, uh, Alex says, Avatar Way of the Water being number one has come to an end probably, but could have one more shot this upcoming week until Quantumania releases in theaters. Yes, that that's where it will be interesting. I do think Knock at the Cabin could be a great, you know, initial opening weekend, but will it gain speed in coming weeks? I don't know. Um, I'm not sure. And then Alex also said, 80 for Brady is easily the most comforting easy watch. You watched it with your mom yesterday. I'm so glad to hear you enjoyed it, Alex. I saw a couple people review it and say that they thought it was pretty decent. And uh, it's it's one of those that I'll probably check out if it starts streaming somewhere. But I'm probably not going to go to the theater to see. Although I do think this lower ticket price for that specific movie is pretty interesting. John says, I wish movie tickets around my area were cheaper. LOL. I live in NYC, so it's expensive. So I use AMC A-list a lot. Let me tell you, AMC A-list for the New York and the Los Angeles markets probably so worth it I don't have an AMC near me so I don't have the ability to use AMC list uh a list but or or anything any of those kind of subscription lists but I think those are a great way if you're somebody who sees movies at least once a week 
there's no reason not to have that. I mean, again, do your own financial research. I'm not <laughs> giving financial advice. I'm not advice to, I'm not in a position to do that. But, but yeah, for certain, for certain areas, if you're going to go see a movie twice a month, I'm sure to pay the, last time I checked what AMC was, it was like $27 a month or something. To pay that and get to see three movies a week, game changer. John also says, I still think M. Night's movies struggle with character dialogue at times. I thought the movie was okay overall, not fantastic. I think it was a movie that, again, I enjoyed watching. I enjoyed the experience. They did this really amazing thing at the press screening where you walk in and there's this, like, score playing almost. Like, a noise like a cabin. And then every couple of minutes it would knock, which was unsettling to say the least. But it felt like when you're waiting in line at Disney, to go back to our original story... You're waiting and like they really just put you in that environment of like, okay, you're waiting outside uh, the the right outside rise of the resistance. You're there. You're in the rebel camps like you hear this music and you hear like the sounds of the world like that was really cool to walk into the theater and have that. But um, but yeah, I again, I don't think it's like the greatest movie ever. Um, I do think twice now my January viewing of a horror-esque movie or a thriller last year was scream i loved i didn't expect to this year it was knock at the cabin i thought it was great it was a good time um i probably wouldn't have chosen to watch it anyways otherwise you know but i think it was good uh i love jonathan groff so like why wasn't i gonna go see it actually i take it back i probably would have gone and seen that movie but but yeah again not it's it's not like but i also don't believe that every movie has to be the most amazing movie ever that's that's a that's a discussion for another time but that's something i strongly believe that not every movie has to be amazing wonderful world of movie says i liked this movie but i definitely don't think it's the, his best i think he has produced a lot of similar quality movies in old split knock at the cabin good to watch but not necessarily oscar level again definitely interesting like i do think so knock at the cabin is based on a book of either the same name or a similar name and so i think in terms of an ad adaptation like i would I'd be interested to know how much more in depth the book goes, but from people I've heard who have read the book, it's kind of the same reaction they had with the movie that like, good, but <clears throat> good, but like not great maybe. Um, but I think it was definitely a very, like he made it very cinematic. Although there was this one scene at the beginning, and again, I don't want to go into spoilers about it, but there's this one scene at the beginning where I feel like the eye lines don't really match, which wasn't unsettling. It was just distracting. I didn't know where people were sitting in relation to each other because, again, it's early in the movie. And I don't know who's talking to who or who they're addressing or what they're reacting to be based on where they're looking. Because I kind of, in my opinion, wasn't laid out the best. But Brian says, wish I saw 80 for Brady over Knock at the Cabin this weekend. But hey, to each their own. Listen. I'm interested to see the 80 for Brady. I thought the concept of the movie was hilarious. And apparently it's based on a true story, which is even better. Okay, that's even better. Um, I just think Dave Bautista was phenomenal in Knock at the Cabin. And I think that's the big takeaway for me. That he's doing a great job. And right before I saw the movie, I saw that red carpet interview he did where he talked about like, I want to be remembered for being really great at my craft, for doing really cool, awesome things. And like being well known, not because like, he's one character that's really important or whatever but just like overall his career that he grew and evolved and I think this was proof that he definitely can do that and that he has he understands the character he's playing in such a clear way that he's able to portray that on screen in a way that feels realistic but also dramatized which I think is super incredible Alex also preferred Aid for Brady over Knock at the Cabin. Okay, well, again, happier media versus more depressing and sad things. So, um, Old was also based on a book. Interesting to see that he's made two movies in a row based on books. I mean, I wonder if that's an indication that he's more... I don't know. I don't know. Maybe he's willing... Maybe these are things that really inspire him, and so that's why he wants to make these things. That's definitely interesting, though, John. Um... Brian also says Dave was fantastic in Nog of the Cabin, that's for sure. Glad these filmmakers are giving him the chance to show his range. Agreed. Like, I think it's really cool because in Glass Onion, you could see him really strongly as a comedic actor, um, which is, again, something that John Cena has clearly shown himself to be able to have those comedic chops. But seeing Dave Bautista in this movie was just, you're unsettled, in times you trust him, you're comforted, 
but there's other like there's just something about his presence on screen in that movie that really I don't want to say steal the show because that sounds kind of cliche but like he he really shows that okay he's not in this acting thing for a couple quick bucks and like this is something more to him I'm not saying it's not to people like John Cena or The Rock I'm definitely not making that assumption at all but it's super cool to see Dave Bautista go from Drax to Leonard who he plays in this film uh yeah Rupert Grint was also in it um again in a slightly unsettling way so again didn't give me Ron Weasley vibes in this movie let me tell you that so okay (coughs) excuse me moving on to probably our biggest news of the week this is probably not going to come in at six but we'll see we'll see if we're done by then but coming in as our biggest news of the week that you've probably all been waiting for me to talk about the dc slate james gunn released that video um i saw it on instagram but i'm sure it's other places too he released a video that was i think it was like 10 minutes long maybe i'm mistaken where he talks about some of but not all his plans for the future of the dcu and the elseworlds kind of universe that they're also establishing at the same time for about the next five or so years so again this doesn't cover everything um but he gave us a good sneak peek and i think to be honest i've talked to several people about this i think this was the smartest thing that james gunn and dc could have done because uh the news stories that have come out over the last six months about dc have not necessarily been positive or looking like a sign of strength for the company and so to come out with uh news that you have this new executive and this is his this is his vision going forward right I think that's interesting it's a position that a lot of other studios or franchises like this haven't been forced to make but I think I really appreciate the level of transparency from a I'm not a DC fan so again all of you please feel free to weigh in in this segment because I'm mainly just kind of reporting this and wanted to talk about this and get some other people's opinion but of course DC is not my bread and butter, but is it going to be with these new changes? I don't know. I It sounds very promising. It sounds very good, but I've heard exciting things from DC before, and I think that's where having Gunn himself explain these things, talk through what he's personally excited about, what he's personally working on, when they're going to start doing these things. I think that's a very interesting model. However, DC does kind of have the more recent history of the Snyder Cut online fan force kind of coming in and demanding it in a lot of different ways. Uh, Not because the Joss Whedon version was good, but, or not because, I'm not trying to say that the Joss Whedon version wasn't bad, but the way that a lot of Snyderverse fans kind of approached getting that cut of the film um, definitely show that DC is willing to respond to their fans in a way that Marvel or other franchise, like, executives haven't necessarily. So I'm interested if, th- how long this goodwill towards James Gunn coming in as a new creative is going to last, especially with this transparency when you're allowing fans a lot of upfront time to kind of react to these things before there's been casting decisions, before creatives and writers and directors have been added to projects. Like, basically what I'm saying is, like, how much will fans get to influence this next portion of the DCU? Or are they giving us this information and there's a lot more that they're hiding? I think it's probably that one. Um, But I'll be interested to see kind of, in this new time of fan kind of power on the internet, how will a studio that's at the interesting point that DC is at go to? So... My key takeaways from the video, again, not as a hardcore DC fan, but just as somebody who's interested to see how this studio plans to kind of dig itself out of the hole that it's gotten in recently, and the fact that this is generally positive for DC versus a lot of things that have come out recently. DC, I thought this was the coolest thing, they intend for their actors to reprise the role of a specific character that they're tied to. For example, let's say whoever they cast as Superman. He would play Superman in live action films, in live action television, as well as live or animated television series or animated movies, which is super cool because I do think that DC more so than Marvel has a lot of people who really love 
the animated the animated projects or kind of the side projects that DC does like of course Arrow and the Flash TV shows have been immensely popular um I think Superman and Lois has done decently you know Harley Quinn that show seems to have a good following Doom Patrol also so like having this kind of goodwill in some areas of your company but not in others I think that'll be interesting to see when you bring in characters or actors um because it sounds like there's going to be a lot of kind of I don't want to say sh across the board rebooting but there seems like there's going to have to be some it will be very interesting to see you know a new approach to a character across multiple different mediums and things however that's for the DCU, which is going to be the cohesive, interconnected universe that DC is going to create, much like the MCU, right? However, there's going to be the Elseworlds, which is going to be the kind of on the outside of the DCU. Things like Matt Reeves' Batman, Todd Phillips' The Joker, and those subsequent sequels. Doing those things and allowing those things to exist and be kind of the film noirs or the Oscar baity things or just do interesting things with these characters rather than sticking to a specific comic book inspiration or a consistency that you've set up for yourself within this universe. I think allowing yourself to do that and confirming to people that that's still going to exist, that was people's, I think, major concern or at least that was something that I was worried about with DC saying like, oh, we're going to bring on James Gunn and we want to have the type of universe that Marvel has in terms of interconnectivity you lose some of the best projects that DC has had arguably in the last couple of years if you do something like that because everyone loved Batman last year. I sort of changed my tune on it a little bit later, but that's that's me. That's me, not you guys. Um, and then like the Joker, incredible, right? Like people are anxiously with bated breath awaiting that version uh, with Lady Gaga as Harley Quinn. I know I am. Like I know I'm going to be there opening night for that. So the thing, there's things like that that... By doing this video, James Gunn has, I think, really, you know, maybe quelled some concerns about that stuff going away with this new connected universe, but getting people excited for this connected universe. There was a couple different TV shows and movies that you talked about. Um, I'm not really going to go into detail of those. Cool thing, I thought, to differentiate. So Marvel's got its phases, and then DC is going to have chapters, and they're all going to be named. So the first one is going to be Gods and Monsters, and then they'll have subsequent names from there. But I think that's kind of a cool, fun thing to kind of tonally connect your phases because I think that's something that Marvel might potentially be struggling with or phase four definitely seemed to struggle with versus the previous phases um but having that tonal approach or that genre approach to a certain chapter of the DC EU or DCU um that's very interesting so I liked that and then the last thing and I just thought this was very interesting because of course with the whole Batgirl situation I've sort of been interested to see what's going to happen with the flash okay if you don't know the controversy surrounding the flash I'm not going to go into it here but um one of the stars of the flash been super controversial but of course you've got michael keaton coming in that you've got people from the tv shows coming into that um it was supposed to be kind of a big moment and james gunn has confirmed that it's for sure coming out that it's one of the best superhero movies he's ever seen and that it's going to be released with large implications for kind of what the DC at large, DCU at large will be. And many people are speculating that that's going to be kind of a reset point, a narrative reset point um, that The Flash is going to do, whether it opens up some type of multiverse or that sort of thing. Again, DC fans, calm your angry uh, keyboard fingers. <laughs> Please don't yell at me. I don't know the proper terminology for DC. I, I don't. But I thought that this was very interesting for a creative to come in not shy away from potential controversy and instead say like I stand behind the decisions that we're making as of present and we're going to move forward with, th with this because um I'm most excited to see Michael Keaton in that to be quite honest that's what I was most excited about with Batgirl and on some on one hand I extremely disagree with the concept of deleting or shelving or just getting I think the movie has been erased like I don't think it exists anymore Batgirl um I think the way that that was handled, I th I don't like it. I it gives me bad bad vibes, bad juju. Don't like it. Mm -mm. I don't like the fact that the directors were out of the country when they did this, and I don't like the fact that they didn't tell anyone beforehand. And I don't, I just don't agree with the fact of like making a movie and then deleting it, like a, scrubbing a piece of art that people have worked, who have missed time with their families on. I don't agree with it. However, 
it is a pretty strong position as a company that's trying to gain some respect from both its fans and its like critics to say like we're not going to release something that is unwatchable as it's been called or unreleasable or something that they don't think is a strong foot forward for any of the talent involved that's a strong statement to make and so to have them stand by that and to stand by this movie that for a lot of different reasons could have also met the same fate the flash um and stand by that so although gun did not announce every aspect of their plan going forward this like overlook plan this top level plan um doesn't appear to also mention or like kind of confirm the return of characters like the jsa um which i'll be interested to again see what happens because for me I, that was like a thing that i liked about black adam but uh it definitely like not confirming too much up front allows gunn and peter safran and other executives and like creatives associated with the dcu going forward to kind of bring back elements as they choose so again it'll be interesting to see that play out but let's get to y'all's comments because i see that you got a few so james gunn also said the flash is going to introduce a new concept for the dcu and says it's one of the best comic book movies ever made a friend of mine saw a test screening of the flash and says it was decent that's where i'm interested because if james gunn has come out and made this like strong stand about the flash if it doesn't do well how does that reflect on the rest of it does it not because we're kind of facing this reboot and his like true reign of the studios hasn't started yet um i'll also be interested to see like when you look at something like marvel kevin feige is not like a he's a producer on most of if not all the projects and movies and tv shows but he is not like a director or a writer whereas james gunn has already been confirmed to be he's writing the next superman movie and he's working on i think the green lantern series that was talked about um so that's interesting to see because what happens if james gunn doesn't work out on a top level planning but he's still a good creative or vice versa like what if he's good for the overall dcu but his projects flop just going to be interesting to see how that stuff happens moving forward um john lee said a lot of voice actors came out against that stance that they're going to hire actors to portray both the characters in live action animated video games again i could see this being controversial i thought it was cool thinking of the way that like what if allowed me to hear certain characters who were for sure the actors like do a different take on the character like hearing tom hiddleston's version of loki in when he like took over like that episode or things like that or like that was fun but then at the same time another fun part of what if was that the actor who had played peter parker and or spider-man in several different animated series came back for that series because they didn't either have the rights to do tom holland or didn't want to so like i think that's fine that they can maybe oscillate between that but having a hard stance of course there are definitely voice actors who are not necessarily they're not uh they don't have the experience doing on camera work in the way that they have extreme success doing voice acting work so that's definitely gonna be interesting john because I, I i can see again i can see both sides of it i can see it being a cool option for an interconnected universe like that really sends that point home however on the other end from a from a more uh, behind the scenes look you're really making a dedication to one actor versus like giving an opportunity to different voice actors so super super interesting um swirly bird we're currently talking about john uh, james gunn's announcement of the dcu slate going forward John says, I kind of agree with the voice actors because a lot of on-camera actors cannot compare to 100% trained voice actors. There's very few actors that can do all kinds of acting. Agreed. And I do think this is, seems like a general trend in the industry, which is something that I'm sure from a voice actor's perspective is something that is not necessarily seen as a positive. So I definitely get that. Um... But yeah, uh, John says, I think the main thing that might be a mistake is not rebooting the whole universe. It might get confusing to the normal people if you keep certain actors and get rid of others. I think the, the only reason I would disagree with this statement is because the DCU, even though it's been within a universe, um, it hasn't felt interconnected. Like, if you look at phase one of the MCU, Phil Coulson pops up in a lot of stuff, if not pretty much most of the things um, in some way. So does Nick Fury. Like, they're kind of popping in and out, right? They're, I think Phil Coulson, Phil Coulson isn't Iron, no, Nick Fury shows up at the end of Iron Man. Anyways, doesn't matter. Point is, they had, there was narrative glue. 
Um, there's not in the DCU as it stands right now. Like, Jason Momoa has been in anything that Aquaman is in. Um, Henry Cavill showed back up as in Black Adam, but we already know for sure that he's not going to do that going forward. So, like, I agree that people could be confused, but, like, for example, the Superman argument, right? If you want to keep The Rock as Black Adam, but you want to bring in a new Superman, if he's got an S on his chest, people are going to figure out who he is pretty quick, you know? And I'm, I agree with you, but the, I think from a company perspective, they're allowing themselves the opportunity to, in 10 years' time, have a Spider-Man No Way Home moment and bring back Jason Momoa or reference something or keep Amanda Waller, which, like, Viola Davis in that role is phenomenal, okay? Phenomenal. I will not hear elsewise, otherwise. So there's things like that that clearly worked, um for them prior and like I think it'd be really wrong to take something like Peacemaker scrap it um you know what I'm saying like I like I I get where you're coming from but I think this is I think not doing a hard reboot is probably the best way for them to salvage what works now but have a new outlook going forward um so so that's that. Um, I can understand the Elseworlds thing with Matt Reeves and Batman and Joker, but to keep some actors and get rid of some will deaf confuse the general audience. I think I'm just interested to see how talent reacts. Like, for example, you keep uh, you keep Joaquin Phoenix as Joker, you keep Robert Pattinson as Batman in that Elseworlds universe, but, like, I'm genuinely curious to see what happens with a character like Jason Momoa, who I don't even really, I didn't really even like the first Bat Aquaman, but I think Jason Momoa is a cool guy, and he seems to fit that role, like, I, he fits that role so well that it's interesting to me that there could be a world where he's not Aquaman anymore. But I also think the DC's strongest suit is to get some new characters with new actors that are A, cheaper, B, not as, like, wanted around the industry, and expand on new characters. Like, Guardians of the Galaxy was relatively unknown. A lot of the Avengers that we now know, like Iron Man, they weren't, like, top of the top. Like, the top guy's always been Spider-Man. But when you're not, you don't have the right to that, or you don't have the right to the X-Men, you got to find a new way around it. And I think that create, that forced creativity will ultimately benefit the DCU. I agree that general audiences might be confused, but, like, people who, like, older people who might not be as in tune with the popular culture, either A, don't care as much, like, they just want a good movie, which DC hasn't really provided them thus far. Apologies to my DCU stands in the chat. But also, like, uh, people know that different actors have played different iconic characters over time. Like, they know that uh, Linda Carter was uh, Wonder Woman in the TV show and that Gal Gadot is in the movies. Like, I think it's things that, like, you can't, uh, these superhero movies are not made for general audiences anymore. They're made for the fans. I think that's been proven um, to be the best way to get this to work. And then if fans love something enough, they'll drag general audiences with them. But I don't think it's wise to limit yourself to stick with actors that may not be working or narrative lines that may not be working just because you don't want to confuse general audiences. Anyways, that's, again, my take on that. Um... Alex says, breaking news, uh, Ludwig will not return to compose for Mandalorian Season 3. That's super sad. Um, but wait, it's already, so this is, so somebody must have seen the credits for the, for, um, Mandalorian Season 3, uh, which is so soon, which is so soon. Um, Aquaman and Flash were in Peacemaker Season 1, too. Exactly. So, they just gotta, I think they just gotta steamroll forward with this plan. James Gunn seems like he knows what he's doing, and we're just gonna have to trust him, and the proof will be in the pudding, quite literally, with this. Um, hi, Jack! Welcome to the, welcome to the stream! Welcome to the first episode of Above the Line. Um, and let's see, uh, I think you would disenfranchise the DC audience if you throw away the few things that have worked with them so far, like Peacemaker, Suicide Squad. Agreed! Like, Perfect example, too. Two of the three things mentioned here are James Gunn things, so they're obviously not going to be hard rebuted. I think we're just, we're living in an unprecedented time with the way that DC is 
being done. They can't follow the Marvel model because that's just not the way the DC works. Um, if they were to get rid of the Elsewhere Universe stuff, like the Matt Reeves Batman, they wouldn't be up for awards consideration, let's be honest. Um, they wouldn't be bringing... Like, they have to make things in the way that a fan would want something made. Like, but half the cool thing about Black Adam was that was that The Rock had been wanting to make that version of Black Adam and be that character for so long and that it was just stuck in development hell, basically, for a decade plus. So, I think, I think again, like I said before, the proof will quite literally be in the pudding for these DC movies. If the first couple come out and flop after this, like, soft reboot, then you can make the call that they made the wrong choice or they made the right choice but they didn't do it right or they didn't do enough etc cetera, etc cetera. but again i think it would be dumb to basically hold up a big middle finger to fans currently who like certain things say we're not doing any of that anymore and you got to get on board with the new stuff plus i don't know what contracts they have in place with people like uh jason momoa maybe he's still on a contract for two more aquaman movies or two more aquaman appearances and yeah for sure they're gonna uphold that deal not to piss off jason momoa and to keep their money. Um, we'll take John's comment last. I'm really curious to see how James Gunn handles the pressure of being co-CEO since he's a creative guy. Exactly. I wonder if he'll be pressure to oversee everything and have too much on his plate. My thing is, my fear is that part of the strong suit of the later uh, phase, phase three, we'll say, of Marvel is that you have different creatives doing different things. And I think if this just becomes the James Gunn verse, that won't be as successful. But I just hope that his projects do well enough to I agree it's just gonna be interesting again it's gonna be interesting uh to see how things like superman legacy how does that work if it flops but people like the new person casted as a uh, superman or they don't like him casted but the movie was actually good or you know what i'm saying like that'll just be interesting to see all right and our very very last story of today i know i said i was gonna be done by six uh clearly that's not the case we're gonna finish this out strong I did not clickbait you. This next story is, in fact, about The Last of Us and Pedro Pascal. So this might be slightly old news for you, but The Last of Us is killing it on TV. Um, it is it is huge. It is it, it's breaking milestones for HBO. It's doing great things. Uh, Pedro Pascal Pascal owns both the internet and television quite clearly. Um, it's strong. It is for you to know it's been renewed for its second season and it is becoming hbo's second largest cross-platform series so of there's four series that hbo has released simultaneously across hbo and hbo max that have beaten the 15 million mark and they're all current series so the lowest being white lotus season two the next highest at i believe 19 million being euphoria season two then you've got the last of us at 21.3 average weekly viewers and then the top being house of the dragon which of course is the first season is concluded but it's ongoing series at 29 million weekly viewers so the last of us is closing that gap between itself and house of the dragon in viewership numbers like i said before about i think it was, it was right after the second episode that it was announced that it's renewed for season two so were we were any of us surprised with that no but i'm happy um, and for the second week in a row with episode three, of course, episode four is tonight on HBO to do a little promo for them, free promo, not that they need it. Um, but with episode three, it marked the second week of viewership growth for the show. So meaning that the second episode, more people tune in than the first and the third episode, so on, that more people tune in than the second. So yeah. And I think the one thing they really have going for them beyond the amazing story Beyond the writing of Craig Mazin and the writers on the show and Neil Druckmann's creation of the game and, and all of the people, I'm such a fan of the people behind this series, um, specifically Craig Mazin. Like I said, I love the man. I think he's phenomenal. Um, his podcast, Script Notes, is great. And you should definitely be watching or listening to The Last of Us podcast with him, Neil Druckmann, and Troy Baker, who plays uh, Joel in the video game. We You've got Pedro Pascal, which is... You know, nowadays is basically he's the golden goose, okay? To put it in perspective, 
The Last of Us will run through part of March, at least like the first two weeks, which is when The Mandalorian will start. And for February, for Pedro Pascal's unique mark, not just the continuation of The Last of Us, last night he hosted SNL and he broke character several times, but he was hilarious in a couple of the skits. Of course, it's SNL, so it's half good and half bad most of the time. But I did think that Pedro Pascal's monologue was great. I thought he was phenomenal. And it's interesting because I think the way that we look at stars in Hollywood or like the biggest stars is shifting. It used to be movie stars like George Clooney, people who are exclusively in movies who don't really do TV anymore. TV used to be seen as a lesser medium than movies. But now you are seeing people like Harrison Ford do TV shows, the Yellowstone spinoff or prequel series, I guess. Um, you're seeing huge names do things like this. And Pedro Pascal is uniquely positioned because his two largest things, I think I would argue like his two biggest, most prominent roles, most well known for these roles is now The Last of Us and The Mandalorian. And in The Mandalorian, the man doesn't even have to show his face. Okay, that's how incredible this man is. So I think he's proving to be um, the chokehold, the quite literal like owner of the first quarter of 2023. Between now and March, like, Pedro Pascal will just continually be everywhere. This is why I am making my campaign known now, my belief that this man is going to win Sexiest Man Alive, People Meet Magazine, Sexiest Man Alive this year. Because the, the, the dominance that he has over the industry right now, and he only has one show on the air right now, he did SNL, and then he's going to be doing Mando soon. Where once again, he doesn't even show his face, but his just, his star power is at such a peak right now and I'm so interested to see what next big thing he does because obviously The Last of Us again it's been renewed for season two so we can expect to see more of him in this. This season of The Mandalorian hasn't been announced as the last season of The Mandalorian so we could see more of him in that show in the future but like what's the next movie? Does he get cast in DC again beyond his role as Max in Wonder Woman 1984? Does he get in the Marvel Universe? Like where, does he do just some other like oscar type role like where's he going the only place is up from here basically but i just wanted to be able to gush about the last of us and how phenomenally brilliant and well done that show is um oh and then of just of course how great pedro pascal is which i think we can all agree on but let's see what you have to say to wrap out this episode this first episode of above the line um John says, I wish industry got more love on HBO Max. One of my favorite shows. It's under the radar and no one talks about it. I've heard a couple people talk about it, but I have not watched it yet. So I guess I am contributing to it not getting as much love. But yes, I'm also so psyched for episode four of The Last of Us tonight. Um, I think it's really also creating fan confidence in the ability for the right creative to be able to... Um, adapt something I think it is such again I could gush about Craig Mazin for like hours upon hours like I think the man is so brilliant and his talent writing wise I just finished Chernobyl this weekend oh he's so good but The Last of Us specifically I think it's so interesting to hear the podcast after you watch the episode and see where they made the decision to change something where they decided to keep it um I think they've just done a really good job um John Lee also says it's crazy because The Last of Us is going to be up against the Super Bowl next week unless they change the time and the Oscars. Uh, well, the Oscars is not next week. The Oscars is in March. March 12th. So that's different. But yes, it's going to be up against the Super Bowl. I'll be interested to see if they change it or if they take the hit because to me, it's better if they just release it and then it's up on HBO Max because people will watch that Monday night for sure like they're gonna come home from work that Monday after the Super Bowl and be like watch The Last of Us if they don't watch it that night um I wonder if they might do something where they release it a couple hours earlier on HBO Max and still do the telecast because like I'll be honest if they for some reason had it up at 10 in the morning I'd be watching The Last of Us and crying my eyes out at, at 10 in the morning I would do it um so yeah um Thank you, Alex. You also enjoy the fourth episode of Last of Us tonight. Um, the finale for The Last of Us is going to be up the same day as the Oscars. See, now that, I have no doubt that people are going to choose to watch The Last of Us finale over the Oscars. In fact, that's going to be a hard one for me because 
Uh, not that I don't care about the Oscars. I do as much as I wish I didn't care about award shows. I love watching them. They're fun. Um, but I'm taking The Last of Us over watching things that I probably didn't watch win. <laughs> to be perfectly honest. And I'm sure that's the way the majority of America will feel. But guys, that is going to conclude this first episode of Above the Line. Again, this is going to be every Sunday. I don't have a specific time yet because I'm sure next week something's going to change and 5 p.m. is just not going to work for me. Um, I also apologize if this was a little bit too lengthy of an episode or there was just like not enough general intrigue or interaction. I've loved talking to you guys about these specific stories. Um, I hope this is also makes for a really great rewatch series and I'm going to try my best to make these into little shorts that drop within the week. So if you came in late for the stream, had to leave early, or you're watching this on replay but want to hear like a specific segment again with a little bit more gravitas, I will be making these into YouTube shorts to kind of supplement my um, slow building of, of video videos this year because I know I've been a little lackluster with that. But to keep this short and sweet, thank you so much for tuning in to our inaugural episode of Above the Line. I hope you enjoyed learning about these stories. Again, check out the description down below because I'm going to include my show notes as well as the links to the stories that I talked about here so you can kind of get the facts straight from the source rather than from me. Thank you guys again. Have a wonderful rest of your Sunday evening. Enjoy The Last of Us tonight and have a great start to your week tomorrow.